Hello, everyone, and welcome to this delightful virtual encounter with Jessica B. Hill. Uh, my name is Rodrigo, and I'm the Artistic Director of Shakespeare in the Ruins, SIR, on Treaty One territory, right here in Winnipeg, Manitoba. As I said, I'm speaking from the SIR office right here and on Treaty One, the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and of course, the heartland of the Métis Nation. It's also important to acknowledge that our water is sourced from Shoal Lake 41st Nation. We're incredibly grateful to be here, to be able to play here and have our offices here. And as an immigrant, I feel very grateful to be here. So thank you. Um, and speaking of being grateful, thank you, Jess, for being here. Uh, Jess and I met at the Birmingham Conservatory in Stratford nearly six years ago and then performed together for about four seasons. And she's one of my favorite actors and now one of my favorite playwrights. We pretty quickly bonded back in the day over the fact that uh, we came to Shakespeare as outsiders. Um, Jessica as a mixed race artist and me as a Latino immigrant. And we were painfully aware that Shakespeare didn't write with us in mind, but we both felt that he loved us somehow and we loved him back and we loved his words. Um, so somehow uh, we find ourselves here making Shakespeare at this time. And with everything that is happening at this moment in this great uh, theater pause and the conversations that are, are happening right now around justice and representation, uh, tapping into this idea of being an outsider uh, Jessica wrote a new play called The Dark Lady, inspired by the mysterious poetess Emilia Bassano, who might have been the dark lady um, that we know of from Shakespeare's sonnets. And we at SIR, with support from the Manitoba Association of Playwrights and Shakespeare in the Saskatchewan, have been workshopping this play with Jessica. And in the process, Jessica has uncovered many other outsiders that have been somehow forgotten through time. And this web series here, this, these series of conversations that we're having with Jess, uh, will, will uh, you know, it's a chance for, for Jess to share with us some of these outsiders she has uncovered, some of these voices that somehow have been neglected by the very serious world of classical theater. And uh, without further ado, let's have a chat. Hello, Jess. <laughs> I wrote it. <laughs> like I don't know you well. That's awesome. How are you? How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How yeah. has, uh, starting with the big one, with a big question before we dive into The Dark Lady and what has, what has um, inspired you in this process, how has lockdown culture been for you? Where are you right now? I'm in Montreal right now. Yeah. So I think the reality is a bit different from Winnipeg. We're under a curfew, 8 p.m. Oh, wow. You have to be inside. Um, I... It was fine at first because everything's closed anyway, so it felt like there wasn't really much to do. I'm starting to feel it. <laughs> I gotta be honest, I'm starting to feel it. The days, oh, I, I heard someone describe what this life is like now. It's not so much working from home, but working, oh, <laughs> what is it? It's not so much working from home as it is work, bringing home to work. Like right. we're, we're there, right? right, all the time. So. I start realizing like going from a self tape to a zoom call, I don't have to factor in travel time, right? It's just from the couch to here so I can fit more stuff in. And before you know it, you, you've just worked the whole day. And yeah, the lines are blurred. <laughs> yeah. Everything is blurred. It's and, not and healthy. Our focuses are no. blurred. Yeah. But yeah. somehow in this moment of blurred lines and, and uncertainty within less than a year, you were able to create a new play and you were not a playwright before, right? So oh. tell us about The Dark Lady, like how, because uh, we all talk about, you know, in lockdown, Shakespeare wrote King Lear and we go like, ah, eh, whatever Shakespeare. But you actually did that. You actually wrote a play inspired by Shakespeare somewhat and, uh, and it's happening. How, tell us about The Dark Lady. Well, first, I, um, it's a survival mechanism it's survival through creativity i don't think i went out with the journey of, of doing it i think it was um it was it was either that or i don't know what was going to happen kind of thing um okay so how this started was you know they say ideas are kind of like the meeting of two different 
thoughts that create something new. And I think this was sort of what happened with me. Um, I, I had read the sonnets. I think a lot of theater students study the sonnets at some point. Um, they're, they're useful because they're short and they're in I versus um, they're personal. Other... They feel personal. But yeah, they're personal. Yeah. So, you know, I had always, I'd read them, but over the winter of 2020, 2019 into 2020, um, I read all of them at once in preparation for, uh, I was going to play Helena in All's Well That Ends Well at, at the Stratford Festival. And there's something in Helena that is very close to the voice of the author of the sonnets. Like, um, being an outsider looking in, being of low, lower class, being in love with someone of a, a higher status. Like there was just a lot of that pining there that I wanted to investigate. And so I read all of the sonnets, got to the Dark Lady sonnets, which have always fascinated me. Just the name upsets me. There's a lot in there that's crunchy. Um, but I wanted to, you know, get through all of them. And, you know, you read the first ones, the ones that we know. Oh, my mistress eyes are nothing like the sun. Oh, yes. Oh, it's so beautiful. And then you get to there's this little section of sonnets that are evil. They're cruel. They're they're jealous. They're angry. And they stand out from everything else that's in that sonnet canon. Um, there's especially two or three that I can think of now that they almost read like revenge porn. Like, wow. they're just so cruel and so um, raw that it didn't right. agree with anything else that we really, we never think of Shakespeare that way, I guess is where, what I'm getting to. We, we, we tout him up on this almost godly reverence, right? And we never quite, Go, oh yeah, right. He was a he was a human man who, if these are actually autobiographical, biographical, he um, he, he went through something dark. And do, do you believe? <laughs> dark, you know, no pun intended. Right. Do you believe they are? Because it's very tricky, right? When we talk about Shakespeare's work being autobiographical, uh, because given that the word auto, um, the word autobiography itself was not you know, popular until the 1700s, apparently. Um, do you do you believe that somehow the sonnets, at least, are autobiographical because they feel so personal? Or are you, do you think you're going like, I'll, I'll, I'll choose to believe the autobiographical so that I can maybe see some humanity behind the words? What do you think? It's a big, big question. Read, it's a big question. Um, and I'm not a scholar, so I can't just say like, oh, yes, I've done the study of it, right? So I can't. All I can say is there's a reason why theater students are asked to do those those sonnets. Um, you and I went to Scotland to study with Kristen Linklater, and there's a reason why she made us do those, not just monologues, because there's nowhere to hide. You're in the eye, right? I do this, I this, and it's deeply personal. It's deeply re revelatory. Is that a... <laughs> Not like revelatory, it, it, revelatory it yeah. yeah. Revelatory, like you, there's nowhere to hide how you feel about the greater things in life. And I liked that when we went to Scotland, she gave us the choice. She didn't give us a sonnet, we got to pick. And then when you put it on, and then you're putting all these guards on as, as a young actor trying to, <laughs> you know, well, I'm presenting this thing. And yeah. then she tears it all apart to get to the essence of why did you choose that? How do you feel about love? How do you feel about jealousy? How do you feel about all these core things of what makes us human and vulnerable are exposed? Um, if you want to think that he didn't use his own life to write it, that's one thing. But how much more exciting it is to think that he did. Imagine, yeah, they feel. I, I think there's more to, to gain from that line of thought. It's true. They feel deeply confessional, right? They feel very much like, mm -hmm. and here's a very, again, not to use the pun, dark, these are some dark thoughts I have. And then, um, and they seem to be, to me, to be so concerned with time, with decay, with loss, with grief. But these particular dark lady sonnets seem to be much more popular than most sonnets. Why do you think that is? What is it about the dark lady? How did they come about when you, because you, you started the, the idea for the play kind of came to you through the sonnets, right? Through this mysterious character of the dark lady. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that particular set of sonnets is so popular? Is it their, 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 their naughtiness and cruelty that you mentioned earlier? I think that has something to do with it. I think um, 
the anonymity of, of it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's the same thing with the fair youth. I think that's what sort of carries the sonnets to um, a place where anyone can get what they want out of them. Um, you know, there's something about the fact that the character of Rosaline in Love's Labor's Lost has a lot in common with, with the sonnets too. So it makes us want to make connections or find connections where we're not sure if they are, we, we, we fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Think yeah. about the, the fascination there. And, and this mysterious character, right? Behind the, behind the, the, the words. So was yes. that, was that? Well, okay. Well, what pits, pisses me off about yes. that is that it's, it's only his side, right? It's like, we've been given this, this diary of, of his anger at this woman, but we never actually get her side of the story. So we're, we're left with this portrait of a very cruel woman that sort of toyed with this man's heart right? and then ended up having affairs and he found out about them. And it just sounds like there's a love triangle at the end. Like you're not quite sure how it resolves, but she doesn't come off quite well. And I think that that upset me. Um, and basically I kind of just left that in, on the back burner and went on with my life and COVID hit. Um, you know, we, we lose everything. We don't really quite know what's going to happen, but I was sort of left with this world of making connections where there weren't any and thinking of, how did it start? Well, actually it was, it was Fiona with Here For Now Theatre in Stratford that um, quite quickly she cobbled together a theatre festival realizing that, okay, we were just coming out of lockdown or we were about to, seeing the numbers going down and sort of said, okay, if we can just get people putting on new shows that they're writing um, for, as I think we could only see 10 people outside at once, but with the forward thinking of maybe 20, maybe 30 down the line, um, she offered me a slot, but I had nothing written, but I had that idea that was just sort of there, like this dark lady, this dark. So I said, yes, not knowing what, what I was gonna do. And then um, my living room turned into a mad scientist experiment. Like I just, <laughs> I printed out all the sonnets, the dark lady sonnets, and started to look for these connections that I'm talking about. These sort of, oh, that kind of makes me think of Cap Katerina in Taming of the Shrew, or that kind of makes me think of um, Rosaline in As You Like It, or Viola in Twelfth Night. Like all of these protagonists or these females, I started to see a progression in how he wrote women, which I kind of, I think we all sort of felt, but it was, I, I saw it. I like knew it more somehow. Yeah. Um, and so I started to see how I could tie his work, his sonnets to his work, like to his uh, plays. But it wasn't until I started to research Amelia Bassano that everything tied together. Um, so she's one of the candidates for this dark lady because right. she comes from a, a family of musicians. There's one of the sonnets that talks about a woman playing a keyboard instrument. Um, and she she has quite an interesting backstory, but what really did it for me was her poetry. She wrote, and we don't talk about that. We only see her right. through his lens, right? She's the Shakespeare's dark lady. There's the apostrophe. She belongs to his story. But suddenly I see this woman who wrote poetry and not only wrote poetry was a proto-feminist she was writing things from the woman's point of view she 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 takes the story of adam and eve and goes well you know eve was seduced by the serpent she was seduced by the devil adam was just seduced by eve and he's supposed to be the stronger of the two so so she starts bending the narrative to see it from a different angle um it's fascinating she ends her poetry with men let us have our equality see us as equal see us as as the same um let let the fact that we bury you and and suffer through childbirth be a bar against your cruelty against us it's it's kind of um anyway it it, it knocked my socks off and it really made me start to see that there might be something more there because suddenly you have this woman that has a strong female voice and is trying to change the way her community or her culture sees women. Uh, and then you have Shakespeare who's slowly learning how to write women and the two just went, okay, maybe this is something, maybe there's a story behind that. That's and brilliant, that's brilliant. You thought about <laughs> the development of his 
the creation, the, the, his, his development in, in the creation of, of female characters, mm -hmm. the, mis the mystery of the sonnets, mm -hmm. given that feel very personal. And then you tied it all to this real historical figure. Like we're talking about a real person who lived on this earth, Emilia Bassano, at the same time Shakespeare was around. Yeah. And is your, was your thesis from the beginning, well, like, so we have all of these, all of, all of these words that show us um, sort of like a development, development of a voice, of a playwright's voice. Maybe she had something to do with it. Is that your first, your first instinct? Maybe she's yes. part of this history and then we don't yes. talk about that? Yeah, right from the start. Um, you know, she's a, she's a strong candidate, but I have to be honest, the more I research it, the more I am, I'm sold. I'm sold on it. It's her, for sure. I love it. Um, it there's a lot of, there's a lot out there as proof that her family was Jewish, but was hiding it. Um, the Bassanos, that's not actually their actual name. They came from Venice, but it was a small town on the outskirts of Venice called Bassano del Grappa. So they took the name of their town. Um, and then even then her grandfather's name before he took the, na the name of the town was Piva, but that was a nickname because Piva is actually a, a wind instrument that he invented. So we don't know what their name actually is. And um, we, do, we do kind of know that well, during the, uh, the Spanish Inquisition, a lot of, of people of Jewish descent and um, uh, a lot of Moors had to leave that area, right? Or say that they were converting and whether they actually did or not is left sort of up in the air. Uh, so you had this very strong migration towards other places that were either more tolerant or more la 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 la, we don't wanna know kind of mm -hmm. thing, right? So it, it, it seems pretty sure that she was, uh, she was Jewish, she was of um, Spanish descent. And then even then there's, there's some school of thought that say that she was Moroccan or North African. So it kind of just, suddenly you have this woman that has a very, very, and I, being mixed race, I can't help but be like, oh, give me that. Like yeah. you have this woman that is a diaspora of Europe and Africa at that time. Um, her family sort of leaving Italy finding themselves in, in England, having to hide part of who they are to blend in or, or did they, or were they able, like, were they able to find a way to, to voice their truth or, you know, it, it just, it spoke to me and it spoke to me through his work. Suddenly I, I, you know, you look at Shakespeare wrestling with a lot of that stuff and not necessarily succeeding at it. Right. There's been so much talk about whether, Merchant of Venice can still be done, whether Othello is racist, like, yeah, uh, but not, but uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, he was of his time. But it's kind of amazing that he was wrestling with that stuff. And there's been so much out there saying that there were there was no one that was Jewish in England at that time, or there, there couldn't have been black people there at that time. But then you read these books, like black tutors, we were everywhere, <laughs> you know? So, um, I've just been really reconsidering what we've been taught and what else it could be, I guess. Yeah, like this, this, you, you know, you, you, erasure of history is, uh, is devastating. And, you know, it's, a, it's um, the loss of a memory, right? We lose the memory of what makes, you know, what makes us human. And um, it's devastating when you, when you just, you know, you find somebody as interesting as Emilia Bassano, but, you know, somehow she doesn't have the weight in our literary classical tradition that Shakespeare does. And I love that you were, you went right in there and said, she deserves more credit. She deserves more voice. She deserves more you know, value for what she's done. So would you, so your first drafts, you basically, you use Shakespeare's work and you put Bassano in there as an active sort of like agent in the creation of that work, right? You were kind of like repurposing the work. Is that correct to, 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 to say that? Yeah, I think so. I think I sourced material from both his work and hers and started using, um, it, it became a kind of po poetic intertextual dance. So what happens if you put his, this monologue of his with this poem of hers next to each other? What themes start to echo back and forth? Because there's a lot. 
um, one of the most fascinating moments of ahas that happened was, ooh, I want to say it's Sonnet 127. Um, he has one line talking about black as a raven. And I took a poem of hers describing Jesus on the cross. A lot of her poems are religious in content. And then you start to see that there's a poetic sort of narrative happening underneath. Um, so uh, uh, did I say poetic? Political. <laughs> narrative underneath so she has um she has the religious thing going and then right underneath you start to see that she's saying something else at the same time she has this beautiful poem about jesus and it's it seems like it's an ode towards a person that she's in love with it, it seems a little bit too erotic a little bit too sensual to be just jesus on the cross dying um but there's a, a line in there his hair is black as a raven and when i put both poems together the words black as a raven were at the exact same place and my mind kind of that's blew. Yeah, yeah that's astonishing yeah that's astonishing and and like what are some of the historical facts you you uncovered in your in your, in your research about her whereabouts during shakespeare's lifetime was she living in london because you you mentioned earlier in a conversation that you and i had about um all these documents that that connect shakespeare to her family maybe you know, and and are there, so where was she at the time Shakespeare was becoming Shakespeare? Was she living in London? She was born in London. She was living mm -hmm. in London. Uh, her father and four of his brothers, they were, they were six Bassano brothers, but five of them went to England under Henry VIII. Um, right. Italy was like this beautiful, artistic, thriving community. England was just trying to show that they were too. Um, <laughs> Henry loved music, so he brought in a lot of musicians from from Venice with promise of, you know, we're going to pay you well, you're going to be musicians for the court. So her father was a musician at Henry's court, Edward, Mary, Elizabeth, and James. The Bassanos sort of stayed, her That's father passed by then, but the Bassanos sort of stayed as court musicians that whole time, which kind of makes me think, okay, these people were able to navigate a very, very tumultuous political time, a very tumultuous religious time. They were able to hedge their bets or were very good at being like, look, we're just here to play the music. Like, I don't know. Or maybe they were just very talented. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's pretty amazing that they stayed the whole time. Um, so yeah, her father passed away when she was seven. She was brought up by a, a, a countess, an English countess. That happened a lot with, but it just also speaks to that they were high enough socially that she was able to, to have that kind of um, upbringing. Right. And she was lucky. The Countess loved education. She loved to read and she fostered, she fostered her and she brought her up almost to uh, like the high level of, of a gentlewoman. Like she was properly schooled in, in Latin and Greek. And um, that upbringing kind of mirror Helena in All's Well That Ends Well in a way. Completely. Yeah. That's yeah. astonishing. The countess relationship and the, the mentorship. Yeah. See, that's. So she was in court around him when he was around court. So, yeah, when she was about 18, the the countess is going to remarry. She was a widow, so she probably had all the, the attention for quite some time. And then when the countess was to remarry, there was no one for her to go home to. Um, her uncles had their own families. Everyone was kind of doing their own thing. She was at a point where she had to make a choice. And she was lucky that because she was being brought up by the countess, they would go to court quite often. And the most powerful man in England under the queen, the Lord Chamberlain, noticed her. And he was probably like 65 years old. And he said, you know, I'd, I'd like to take you under my wing. We could have a, some sort of a arrangement. So this poor young thing is, is in a predicament of, okay, that's the most power and influence and possibility versus I say no to that and then find a suitable marriage of someone of my stat status and see what, where it goes. And she chose the, the more, uh, you know, ambiguously moral choice of being this, this man's mistress. Um, and it sounds like it was, it was a happy arrangement. They were like, he fostered, her love of music. She was able to perform, it sounds like, too, in smaller gatherings. And we're talking about the same court where Shakespeare was able to perform his plays. So there is 
a possibility that they would have met and known the same people. So is this Lord Chamberlain? Is the same sponsor of Shakespeare's plays? The Lord Chamberlain's men. Yeah. So the, he's the same guy who who whose name is given to Shakespeare's company. Yeah. And he is with Bassano. Yeah. Yeah. See, like at some point you gotta go like, <laughs> yeah, this that's just that's just that's just happening, <laughs> right? That's remarkable. That is remarkable. So then you uncover this thing, and then you in your early drafts you put these two in dialogue with each other, right? Mm -hmm. You you begin with this reimagining of we're at court, and there's Amelia, and there's Will, and they're both ambitious. They're both creatively engaged, musicians, artists. And then what happens between the two of them, you think? What was your spark of imagination? They, they have this sort of like intellectual relationship? Or is it a love, romantic relationship? What, what was the thing that kind of made your wheels go, okay, here we go? I think it's all of the above. Um, I think in my reading of her work, what I found was someone very similar to him. I think they have, they are very similar. Um, there's ambition, deep, deep ambition to rise above their lot in life. Uh, you see it in both of their works. Um, and I think within that, there's also a, a revulsion of the way the world works, the hierarchy, the social class of it. You see that in Shakespeare a lot too. Um, he's lucky because he because he works and plays. He can put those notions into characters' mouths and then be like, "Oh, well, that's just how yeah. this person thinks, right?" Whereas she's writing her poetry from the place of I, so she has to be a little bit more careful of how she she does it. But even her in her religious poems, she writes about, well, you know, maybe we all are the same, and it's just fortune that brings us up or down, but in the end, we're kind of all the same. And once we all die, whether you lived in a castle or you lived in a shack, God's gonna judge you the same. So it's clear that these are notions that were bubbling at the time, but I really kind of heard both of their voices very, very um, reson resonating in the same way at the same time. So I, I imagine if they were to meet each other, they would recognize that within each other immediately. Spark would just ignite yeah. their yeah, yeah, that's amazing. And then what I find remarkable is that you had this sort of mission to uncover her history. And, you know, as you're doing right now, telling us about this, this forgotten voice or, or, or voice that hasn't, hasn't been, you know, valued uh, uh, properly. But then through highlighting her history and putting her in dialogue with Shakespeare, you were, you were discovering your own voice as a playwright this being your first play right your first play and 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 it, it's like i'm you know I've, 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 I've had the pleasure of reading all the drafts so far and i'm i'm more of a fan every draft and i can't understand how you're, you're you keep uncovering more and more of your voice and putting aside some of the actual like set work by shakespeare or Bersano and and discovering your voice as a playwright how was that process for you would you say of um finding yourself through highlighting and elevating Bassano's voice? Like, how did that come about? Did you, was it conscious where you go like, and now it's my thing, or, oh my God, I'm finding my way through her. How, how was your process in that? Oh man, Big I don't question. even know how to, yeah, it's a huge <laughs> question. I don't yeah. know. I think like the survival element, like I was saying before, it wasn't a, a quest of, okay, I'm going to do this thing. It was just, there was no other way. <laughs> <laughs> when you're stuck in lockdown and yeah, yeah. but um, I think she resonated with me in, in such a personal way. This, this need to, well, as, as, um, as a black woman, as a mixed race woman and a lover of Shakespeare, I've wrestled with my feelings about his text. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that as someone coming in from, from the outside. I think even just women can relate to that feeling like, okay, I'm playing the ingenue, now I'm playing the queen, now I'm playing the, the old crone and that's it, right? Like feeling like we don't really have a stake in this thing. This thing that is not really for us. It wasn't even played, it was played by men too, right? Like we're not quite there. Um, and this was a way based on who she is and what, or who she was and who she, what she wanted to accomplish 
I felt I could speak through that and find my place within his work. Find suddenly, okay, I belong here. Okay, this is this is actually mine too. These these words can be can be mine. I don't have to feel like a director's casting me because I'm the flavor of the month or something like I belong in this this canon. Um, so I think that's what sort of has been fueling me. That's that's amazing. That's amazing. You finding yeah. I find I find that you know once you start down this road of of, of finding others that um, make you sort of like feel more. I guess my point is that finding her legitimizes, you know, our passion for Shakespeare in the in in the sense that others felt this the same way, right? Others felt that they didn't um, belong in a certain form or in a certain you know artistic practice. But throughout history, I think we always we always find voices that were trying to be heard, but then somehow the system, the circumstances. Put aside did you did you discover anybody else in your uncovering of the story um that helped you you know uh, uh feel even more legitimate in this serious classical old-timey canon well yeah <laughs> um, so uh it started with a nun called christine de pisan who had children, she, she got married, she had children, her husband died, and they were going to remarry her, I think, and she just went, ah, no, no, and went off to, to a nunnery to write, because then suddenly you're being left alone, and you can just focus on the work at hand, and she wrote, she was about a hundred years before Amelia Bassano, and she was writing this proto-feminist stuff, um, there was this I think it was called Le Roman de la Rose. It was, a, it was this book that had come out in France that kind of gives all the women of history a bad name. Like, oh, the, you know, they were seductresses or they were evil in some way. And she writes the counter narrative. She, she resources and she goes to every single woman that he names and she, she gives them a, a better story, a, a more accurate story, a more feminine perspective on that story. I'm looking at that like, okay, so no one really knows who this woman is. And that's amazing that she did that. So I think that and Amelia Bassano sources her work in some wow. of her work and Shakespeare sources her work in some of his work. And I don't think really? I've heard of this woman before. So I liked that they both did. It added to my, haha, I'm onto something. Yeah. Um, but it also kind of opened the dams to, I mean, I, I'm a curious person and sometimes I can get kind of obsessive about that stuff. And I went deep with it because now I'm watching this woman, uh, Amelia Bassano, go through this and wondering, like, how come we don't care about her poems? How come we don't know about her name? Like, what? And I start to realize how many women have been doing this and it's been happening to her story is not unique. Um, and we've talked about this last summer, but it's led to a sort of a, the, the, the catalog of names keeps getting bigger and bigger as I'm going through this research and I feel like we have to almost uproot the canon that we've been given and give these people a place, right? Yeah, we've got to expand it for sure, because all these voices belong in the same world. And the world is, you know, we think of classical theater and it's like this, you know, very white, you know, male form. And we have our five favorite classical playwrights. But then it's such a, it's such a diverse field. When we start to uncover the truths, right? It comes from the influences come from all over the world, and 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 there are traditions all over the world. You know, when we talk about non-traditional, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, approaches to the classics, well, what does that mean, really? You know, like there, it's it's a it's a huge world, the classic the classical canon. Once we actually do the work you amazingly are doing, which is digging and digging, and it sounds to me that you, you say Shakespeare and Bassano sourced the nuns' work which comes a century earlier, yeah. a century before. So you think, do you envision Bassano doing to her work and finding her voice, what you are doing to Bassano through Bassano's work and then finding your voice? Is that kind of like I, this? In over and over again, yes. I'm starting to see, it's, it's, a, it's a long journey. 
And it's women constantly doing that work and being forgotten. And then women being, well, I wonder if anyone's done this before. Oh yes, look, she has. And then taking her work and going further and then being forgotten. And then it, that's what it sounds like it is um, from what I've been researching. <laughs> I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that that's just the, it's, it's the work at hand, right? And I, uh, we're at a place now where I, th I want to believe that we can, well, especially with the internet, we can actually leave those footprints, right? Because it has felt like footprints in the sand and the water washing it over. But now we can actually have what I think they've all sort of wanted. Um, acknowledgement. <laughs> acknowledgement, yeah. Which is really what I think where play, your play The Dark Lady is sitting right now, right? This idea of acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. Is there, what would you say right now, uh, you know, where's the place sitting in, in terms of um, your mission or your 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 intent your uh, with it is it have you removed most of the of the works by Shakespeare the words by Shakespeare and by Bassano and are you are you riffing on the characters now with your voice and and what are you looking for in terms of uh, of your mission statement with the play it's a big <laughs> what's your huge. mission statement that's huge. I don't know if I can answer a mission statement, um, yeah. but yeah, uh, well, we were lucky to have Kate Hennig as a dramaturge and um, she's been pushing, I think right around Christmas, she's like, you have to get rid of all of the verse that was written by someone else, just to see what you have, like just to hear what your actual voice is. And that was so empowering because then you go, okay, okay, it, it can just be my voice through them um and maybe that's when i realize oh okay it's a play it's not just me resourcing um things that already exist but actually creating something new and then it was a, a huge wrestling match of and i'm still in that wrestling match of pulling him off the pedestal letting us get him down in the muck as a human letting us be irreverent with it maybe he swears Maybe he has a bad day, you know, um, making him sound like a regular person yeah. because I, I, and that's something I'm really holding on to because so often we, we make him something untouchable. Yeah. I find, I find bardolatry, uh, it's a crime against Shakespeare, right? It's like, it doesn't do us any service. It doesn't make my job as somebody who runs a Shakespearean company any easier. No, because I want, I want, I want us to feel like Shakespeare is human. I want us to feel like Shakespeare has flaws. Some of his plays are not very good, <laughs> if you think about, or at least don't have very, you know, good parts. He, he gets better as he goes. He gets better as he goes, and, I, and if you spend a lifetime working with his plays, you realize that, oh my goodness, look at his trajectory. And I like that you put Bassano as part of the trajectory. That as one of the people, and I'm sure he has, he had many collaborators in, in that sense that actually shape who he had, who he becomes, right? And he's not this like godlike, you know, creature writing a dark, in the, in the dark, you know, and just being, cha cha and is channeling God. He needs collaboration, you know? Yeah. And I love that in her play, you know, in the latest draft, I love that she calls him on his stuff, you know, like she that, challenges yeah. him. That's what's been the most, um, it's, it's just so fulfilling to be able to have that thing to bounce off of like, okay, we have to talk about the two gentlemen of Verona and how it ends. Because I've been pissed at that Jessica from you know, the first time I read it. And now Amelia can actually confront him and be like, okay, what's that about? Why doesn't Put Sylvia say? Why does yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Because I find sometimes discourse is often like, you know, like, oh, his work is amazing, untouchable, or he didn't write it. He's a fraud. And it's like, hang on, there's the, you know, like, he, yeah, he existed, and uh, but he, he, he was not, he was not this thing right he was what very much trying to figure it out right yeah something else that you and i talked about earlier was this idea that you know you're really trying to present shakespeare as a man of his time as a man you know from four centuries ago um but it seems to me that she was ahead of her time not just in the fact that she was raging against the system which was designed to oppress her but there's something about her imagination that was so rich in the character you've designed um was that a, a conscious effort to to kind of just endow her with this with this ability to envision a world that shakespeare himself was not willing to break free from 
you know, or 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 is it just naturally came to you in that way? Oh, I don't know. Um, I I think there's something to the fact that she was a a musician to begin with. Mm -hmm. And the pattern, like, how do you go from musician to, oh, I'm a, and I'm a poet as well. And I'm going to publish as a poet. We don't have any of her music. We have her published poetry. Um, just that sort of cross-pollination of the arts has sort of been in my mind space a lot. And I thought, okay, what is, because I have that a bit too. I think a lot of artists have that. When you're looking for creativity, you, you source elsewhere right if i'm working as an actor trying to play a part i might want a piece of music or a, a painting that inspires me so i tried to bring how i feel about that to to her and how rich a um how that would in, in, inform her as a person and her her work and how maybe those are things that shakespeare wouldn't have been as in touch with coming from stratford on avon and then seeing this woman that knows how to dance and sing and and play the piano right and, right? and oh okay yeah. and then suddenly you see his his work so much of his work is set in italy so much of his work right. has musical elements so much right the name bassano comes up a lot or amelia comes up Italy a lot. comes so up a lot yeah it's, um you, you're talking about crossing disciplines right and you yourself in the creation of this went from being an actor to being a writer like you are crossing, and you're also the performer of this piece. Right? You're, you're kind of crossing the discipline of this, these two theatrical disciplines. And, and speaking of expanding the canon and in your uncovering of this really huge world that truthfully represents the classical canon, did you come across other artists that were from different disciplines that inspired you in the creation of this work? Big time. <laughs> <laughs> Loads, so many. Loads, um, so many so that when we were talking about starting this sort of informal chat about it, you had sort of said, oh, you know, maybe, I don't even know if we had a ballpark of, of amount. It was just sort of like find a few and then maybe we'll, we'll talk about it. And the more I would research and the more it would be like, oh, well, this, we have to talk about her, we have to talk about her. Um, we got to a point that there's too many, so we won't be able to get a through wonderful them all. problem to have. Right? <laughs> yeah. Going to the, these series of conversations about um, the forgotten voices of the classical canon, right? And mm -hmm. then, and then I think it's appropriate that we're spending this first, this first uh, 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 um, conversation uncovering Bassano herself as the uh, the voice that hasn't been given proper, you know, weight uh, mm -hmm. by time and 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 history. It's it's funny because that's one of the reasons um, I don't I've been wrestling with whether the title stays because I have such animosity towards the that dark title. lady. Tell yeah. us about that. What 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 are what are you wrestling with right now in your process? Um, well, no, it's just that's the name that they've called her, but the word dark only comes up once in the Dark Lady sonnets. Why so that? It's a name that's been given afterwards. Right? The word black comes up a lot. Black hair, black eyes, beauty. I wish that beauty itself is black or beauty from now on will be black. Like, but we don't call her the black lady. We call her the dark lady. And there's something about dark and darkness and the connotations that that carries as well that um, bother me a lot. And yet I don't want to look away from, I think I kind of want to leave it there as like the, un the discomfort in the room because this idea of darkness and being veiled in it and having to come out of it is important too. And I think that speaks to all the women that we're going to be talking about that they have been in the dark and they need to be brought to the light. So as much as I wish for her never to be called that again, <laughs> I think it's important that it kind of sits there, you know, for us to be. Absolutely. You, well, you were, it feels to me that you're seeing you're seeing the problem like through, you're going through it as opposed mm -hmm. to around it to see what's really festering in there, right? Mm -hmm. And then asking a question of acknowledgement and then name, you know, like you could, there, there, there is a play called Amelia, right? She is a, 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 
uh, a character that has been somewhat explored a bit as this mysterious dark lady. But you are choosing, right now it may change, you're choosing to call it the dark lady and then you're seeing what that's all about. And, but in the issue of, in the, in the question of acknowledgement and, and claiming one's name, she gets published, right? In history, in real life. And then tell me, is she the first poetess in English history in, 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 in England to, to, to be published? She's the first English woman to be published. That's amazing. And to be, because she's published, she's also asking for, for patronage. So she's the first professional poet in England, the first female. The fact that we don't talk a lot about that, like, yeah, Shakespeare's time. And also Amelia Bassano, the first, you know, published English woman, which they never kind of just <laughs> comes up in regular conversation. We all go like, yeah, Shakespeare did this and did that. That's remarkable that she did that, right? Given everything that was, was up against her. Well, it just shows how much it mattered to her. I think it spoke a lot to character for me because you're at a time where it didn't happen, where people didn't think that women read enough for that even because that was the idea. If you're going to publish, it's for women. Women write for women, right? Like that's not. So it, the fact that she wasn't satisfied with just manuscripts being circulated, that it had to be published, that sort of mark of approval of authority. Legitimate, right? Yeah. Legitimate. Yeah. yeah. For someone who was an outsider to begin with as well. Um, yeah, I could see that mattering a lot to her. Yeah. You know, Shakespeare does ask what's in a name, but you know, it's really important. It's really important to have your name. In that time, I think as, as far as I know at that time it was very unusual even, it was starting to become more common for uh, uh, an author to have his single name on a, on a published you know, piece of work. The fact that Shakespeare's name was published and you know, under his name was already a kind of mark of his legitimate you know, uh, um, um, celebrity in many ways. And the fact that she did that, or we don't talk about it, <laughs> is, is bonkers. So in speaking of, of womanhood representation and, and names and, and artists that were, were sort of like not, not valued properly, can you, can you tell us about one or two artists you came across that are inspiring you right now? You mentioned the painter. To me when we talked about oh I'll start with the painter okay oh, sure, yeah, yeah. well there's there's two oh no there's so much okay <laughs> <laughs> um there yeah there are two there are two female painters from Italy that were about 40 years um difference and maybe about 30 years from Amelia Bassano after Amelia Bassano wow. and um they we're going to talk about them when we get to it but mm -hmm. they use the subject matter of their work to a to relieve their anger, their rage, their frustration. Um, and it always puts the woman at the center of the issue. So instead of seeing it from the, ma the male gaze, you're seeing it from the female gaze. We'll talk about that later. There's these sculptors. There's these amazing sculptors coming out of the States in, well, there's one from 1890, there's some in 1910, and they end up traveling to Italy um, because that was the only place that they could actually get the schooling and create this community of, of female artists. So you have these sculptors working with poets, working with writers. Um, Harriet Hosmer, um, Georges Saint, George Eliot, uh, Elizabeth Browning, they all meet there at some point. And we don't talk about that. I've never heard about that before. So I got really fascinated that such a almost a renaissance of right. female empowerment was happening at that time. Um, so we will talk about that. We're we're talk year, about, what year is this? You said you said roughly it, in the 1800s? 18, late 1800s, 1880s to 1920, I'll say, to be safe. So these yeah. these, these uh, women were collaborating across disciplines and, 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 and inspiring each other in that work, right? That's, that, that's remarkable that mm -hmm. we live in a world of like, you know, like you do this, you do that. And we, we kind of don't have this, 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 this across discipline um, mentality that maybe the collaboration of those classical artists was was much more truly collaborative than we 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 usually assume, right? Amelia Amelia Bassano published in 1611, and I'm 
trying to remember when she passed away. She passed away quite late. She was, I think, in her in her eighties, which is quite late at that time. Yeah. Um, and right when she was passing away, this amazing thing was happening where more and more women started to publish their own work, whether it was poetry, um, novels, or plays. Uh, so we started to, or I, I started to go deep onto, okay, who are these women publishing plays at that time? And we know a few just through studying in theater school, you know, um, Afra Ben is, is one that comes up a lot, but who are the other ones? And I started to look not just in England, but what was going on in the world, really. And that was sort of the Spanish golden age that was coming up at that time. And there were women playwrights during that time that we don't really hear about as much, right? Like there are certain, De Vega comes up a lot, Calderon comes up a lot, but we don't- Both names are, yeah, very popular, but then women. Anna Caro came Anna up. Anna Caro. And there's only two, she wrote a lot of poems and a very short uh, comedies that were sort of interspersed in between main acts of things, but she wrote two mm -hmm. full plays, probably more, but we only have two left. So we'll investigate one of those. Um, there's a nun in Mexico that was writing po uh, poetry and plays at the same time as Anna Caro that sort of gets lumped into the Spanish golden age as well, because it was, um, language Who's speaking Spanish yeah and she has a fascinating life so we'll talk about her as well let me try to find her name so but this is astonishing to give folks an idea like Anna Cara for instance the Spanish golden age playwright mm -hmm. like she was born in 1590 right and died in 1652 I mean that's Shakespeare's lifetime mm -hmm. right that's within it's right there and that that was happening next door and and is remarkable this energy that was going around the world at the time that a Mexican nun as well was was creating plays. <laughs> That's amazing, right? That's amazing. And then this before the internet, before people go like, oh, have you heard about this? They just kind of like it happened. Um, it just speaks so much to this our need to. But again, going back to the very first question from the you know that I kind of tossed out there today, how is lockdown culture? This need for creative engagement, right? This, this, this yearning for our voices to just resonate somehow. Yeah. If you have that artistic fire in you, doesn't matter if you are a nun in Mexico or if you are sponsored by the king in England, you're just, you gotta be heard. So speaking of, speaking of this desire to, to to be heard and the, the need we have, we artists have to be creatively engaged in, which we're feeling right now, this, this lack of creative engagement because we're all, you know, and so, so isolated. What's the hope, Jess, for our future conversations, you know, in, in terms of revealing more of your process through the dark lady? Well, the hope is to, to stimulate creativity, to stimulate um, just, <laughs> Inspiration. Inspiration. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think I've found I've found a kind of wow, I can't find my words. <laughs> <laughs> Can we try this again? What a mess. What a Yes, you have the words. <laughs> I have the words. You have the, have words. the words. Um yeah, I want I want it to inspire. I want it to bring creativity. I want us to bring um, a new way of looking at what these words like tradition and canon and history mean. Um, and I want them to have a place. So yeah, I think it'll be an informal talk where I'll bring up a playwright that has been an outsider. Uh, they're mostly women. There's one man who was working as an outsider um, racially in, uh, in Brazil, actually. And so we'll start with the playwright and then we'll, we'll loop in another artistic discipline, someone from um, the visual arts world or a poet or that has something to do with the, the playwright as well, just to, to keep that idea of cross pollination happening. Um, and yeah, I think we're just going to talk and, talk. We might have some guests. And, yeah. 
It's amazing. I know you sent me a brilliant list of artists and, you know, and the names are astonishing and they come from all over the world, Spain, Mexico, the USA, Brazil, um, um, Italy, Japan. Japan. <laughs> this is remarkable. And these are all, you know, the great vast majority of women who are creating in the 1500s, 1600s, 1800s, and creating really important work across disciplines as visual artists, as you say, as poets, as playwrights, as novelists. Um, and I, I find this, yeah, I, I'm excited to talk more with you, Jess, as you kind of share with us how your process of writing The Dark Lady um, is happening alongside this, this amazing, you know, dig that you are that you are doing finding all these other voices of of othered artists mm -hmm. through time and how how their story is not unique but they're beautifully sort of like you know human their plight their plight is not unique that's what has been so upsetting and yet so um it just makes me all the more or gotta get this thing done. <laughs> you know? There's a mission statement right there. There, yeah. Gotta get this thing done. I yeah. gotta let my voice shine through Bassano and 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 put Shakespeare in his place. I love that. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. That's a beautiful place, I think, to wrap this initial conversation up. As we, you know, I learned a lot, even more about Bassano, you know, through you. And I I can't thank you enough for sharing your your knowledge and your research and your passion for this woman who whose work is so influential and, and might have shaped, you know, the man that became Shakespeare, which is astonishing. And, and now we need to we need to shine her voice through through all this. Um, so join us, you guys, in future conversations as we go a bit more in depth with these uh with these amazing artists and uncover more fun more truths, mm. more passions, more stories, more stories. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you soon.